Let's talk about scalability because I think that's the major thing that comes up at this point in the conversation when I'm talking to people, whether it's Joe Rogan on his podcast or anybody else that I'm talking to. People will say, regenerative agriculture is great. Grass feeding, grass finishing is great. There, we can't produce enough beef that way. And I think that's false, and I think you do too. So let's talk about, let's talk about how scalable regenerative agriculture is, that, which is what we're talking about here is raising animals, primarily ruminants like lamb, uh, and cows on the land using rotational grazing, grass feeding and grass finishing of animals, just the way the most properly that we can mimic the way that bison and other grazing species would move on grasslands. How scalable is that? How big can we make that in the country? Could we replace all of the factory farming in the U.S. with that type of agriculture? Absolutely. We can absolutely scale it and we absolutely must scale it because this is this is the biggest this is a trick question. Can we scale regenerative agriculture to feed a growing population? We must because chemical industrial agri agriculture isn't going to be able to feed a future generation, right? We are losing soil. We are losing fertility. We are losing the ability, we are desertifying our land. Think of the Fertile Crescent where life evolved because it was so rich and bountiful. What is left is a desert. That's what happens if we continue down this path and keep beating that same drum, right? Not learning from the lessons of our past, right? So we can't, we can't take the premise of this question and say, obviously we can feed a growing population with industrial agriculture, but can we feed it with regenerative agriculture? No, I, I do not accept that premise, right? We are headed, we are racing towards a cliff. Slowing down doesn't change the reality that we're, we're, plummet, we're gonna be plummeting off a cliff, right? We must do something as an alternative to industrial, chemical, monoculture, plant agriculture, right? So getting back over into, can we scale regenerative, right? Even just within the meat context. And I, I said, absolutely, right? There's a lot of ways that we can do that. And you've had some folks on, I know Diana uh, Rogers and Rob Wolf have been on before, I think, talking about their book, Sacred Cow. They really go into this, but they give a bunch of different examples themselves about um, the amount of land that is currently um, under r row crop agriculture and how that isn't productive throughout the year and how we should be incorporating animal impact onto those lands. We look at the existing animal lands. We look at how they can be uh, managed differently to improve their productivity and hold more animals. We can look at land that's being used not even for food consumption uh, and how it can be used to raise food and land. And we look at land, there's like something like half a billion acres. I mean, the U.S. is only like 2.2 billion acres and there's half a billion acres of land that isn't being farmed at all. And in fact, it is rewilded, which means it doesn't have this natural balance of these animals going on performing those key um, ecosystem services, right? So there's tremendous amounts of land that need to be managed in a different way, utilizing animals and ruminants um, to both draw down carbon and improve the environment and restore ecosystem and habitat and do a number of different things. Um, I mean, I can get into some, some deeper in the weeds and statistics on that, but I think it's just imp important to understand that we have enough land degraded being utilized to raise animal agriculture that if we simply manage that land differently, we could easily improve the productivity enough to maintain our current levels of animal production on that land. And we have tremendous more land available to us. There's so many points to this conversation. I think it's so interesting. And I, I, I think that we can't talk about how scalable regenerative agriculture is enough because that I think is the conversation. When you tell people what it is, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense, but you could never feed everybody with it. And so I think that this conversation of scalability is, is at the crux of this discussion. And you actually touched on something earlier that I want to reiterate, which is that when you draw down more carbon into the soil and that soil has a higher amount of organic matter and carbon, it is also more resistant to erosion. And so right now, if we are not putting carbon into the soil, we are losing our topsoils. That is being eroded with large rain events. So the statistic I've heard is that for every 1% of carbon in the soil, you can sequester an inch of rain in the soil. And so if you have less than 1% carbon or less than 1% organic matter, all you need is a catastrophic or even a, a large rain event of an, of a, an inch, and you're going to lose the topsoil. But at White Oak, which took their farm from 0.5% carbon to 5% carbon in, fi in 22 years, they can now have a 5-inch rain event and not lose the soil, not lose the topsoil because it won't run off. When we were at the bison harvest at Rome Ranch, Taylor had this little 
uh, awesome diorama setup where he had these multiple sections of soil set up with different amounts of carbon. He'd actually transplanted them from different parts of the farm, I believe. And he watered all of them equally. And you could absolutely see that the soil that was more degraded from the more degraded parts of the farm versus the soil from the parts of the farm that had been more uh, highly rehabilitated, which is what they're doing at Rome Ranch, the more highly rehabilitated soil with more carbon sequestered more water. It just stayed in there. It didn't run off. And you could see it in the bottom. There was a runoff space, and you could see this, this low-carbon, monocropped, degraded soil. A bunch of the topsoil ran off. You had dark, murky water. The soil from the land that had been more rehabilitated, much clearer, much less soil coming off the top. So the erosion is critical. But then there's also these other issues we're talking about in terms of um, how much of this land uh, could be used to scale this type of agriculture. There's, if we took all the land that's being used to grow corn that feeds cows, that we're not gonna feed them anymore because we're grass finishing them, we can use all that land. We're gonna need cows to rehabilitate that land. You mentioned the 500 million or so acres in the conservation reserve program, which the government is paying farmers to let it stay fallow. We could be rehabilitating that more quickly with cows. There's so much land. I think you're totally right that we could easily make 100% of the agriculture in the United States regenerative if people got behind it, which is why this message is so important. And it's really like you've said throughout this podcast, and this is why this podcast is so important, we vote with our dollars as, as individuals. And if we're not voting with our dollars, how is anyone going to know? How are the politicians going to hear this? They're going to do what their constituents want to have happen. Unless we talk about this, unless this message gets out there, and this is why I appreciate what Force of Nature is doing so much, unless we get this message out there, no one's ever going to understand this. We need people to understand that when they go to Costco and they buy a grain-finished steak, they're not part of the solution, which probably means they're part of the problem. If you're not supporting regenerative agriculture with your dollars, you are first not getting the most healthy meat, the animals are not living the best life, and the animals are not being raised properly on the land, and we are missing an opportunity to regenerate that land. People will then say, oh, I can't afford it, which is a whole separate conversation we can address at the end.